We're going to do a few exercises to review the, the three ideas we talked about the other day. Then we're going to dive into permutations and combinations, and we're going to have tons of practice today. So let's quickly walk through a couple of these. All right, How many cards must be selected from a standard deck of 52 cards to guarantee that at least three cards of the same suit are chosen? This is the question. We're going to walk through this as a group. First thing, what kind of problem is this? It is a pigeonhole problem. Yeah, very good. It's a pigeonhole problem. So what are the pigeons? What are the holes? Okay, the holes are the suits. Good. And the pigeons, therefore? Yeah, the playing cards you get to put in there, right? So the, the pigeons, it's the number of cards that are, bless you, it's the number of cards that we don't know what that is yet. That's what we're trying to solve. We're trying to figure out how many pigeons we have. Okay? And then the holes are the suits. <clears throat> so remember the generalized pigeonhole principle. This formula, if there are n objects to be placed into k boxes, then at least one box will have the floor of n divided by k objects in it. Right? You remember that? Or ceiling. Yeah, did I say floor? Yeah, sorry, ceiling. That's what the upper things mean there, sorry. That was just a brain cramp. All right, so what variables do we know? So we know the, we know K, yeah. There's 13 cards per suit. Okay, there's 13 cards per suit. Look at my question mark next to those variables there. I have an N, a K, and an X. Uh, what's, which one of those three do we know? What is X even? What, what is that representing? X is the output of our formula. N over K ceiling equals X, right? So of those variables, we know two of them. We know K, which is for the boxes, and the, the N is the unknown. That's what we're trying to solve for. And then what is X? That's a number we know based on our problem. Three. It's three. Right, because we're saying that some number divided into some number of boxes will equal one box has at least three or more, right? So we know that this number will be greater than or equal to three. And in our case, it's exactly three, right? Well, it says at least three cards, so greater than or equal to. Okay. So n over k equals x. This is our formula here. Let's try to apply it now. We plug in the numbers here. We have n over 4 is equal to 3. All we have to do is ask ourselves, what are we looking for? We're looking for something that's 2 point something. Right, n over four is equal to two point something because we will ceiling that to three, right? Does that make sense? So what's what's the value? Well, I gave it away nine. <laughs> okay, sorry, I thought my slide had one more slide before then. Yeah, it's nine. Think about it. If I tried seven, four goes into seven one point something times. If I tried eight, it goes in exactly two times. Exactly two will not ceiling up to three. But 9, which gives us 2 point something, will ceiling up to 3, right? So that's how we solve that. Does that make sense? So this is more of a visual representation of it, and this maybe works for, for different people's brains, right? But the idea is this. I could have gotten lucky, and the first three cards I drew were the same suit. And they all go into that box. That was weird. My transition was funny. But they all go in the same box, and bam, it was three cards, and at the end, we've got what we need. But that's not a guarantee that the first three cards I will draw will be the same suit, right? Does that make sense? So we're looking at what's the worst case scenario. This is like our sock problem the other day. What's the minimum amount of socks I can pull out to guarantee that I'll get at least a pair of, of socks, okay? So let's take a look at it this way. Let's say we place the first round, we put one of every suit, and one of each suit goes into each box. And then the second round, same thing happens. One of each suit goes in each box. So now every box has two in it. This is a worst case scenario. Again, all these could be in one box. This is a worst case scenario. Well, at this point, when that third card's ready to go in, no matter which box it goes in, it doesn't matter which one's next, that box will have three cards in it, right? Okay. So which one should we put in there? Spades. Spades. Are you sure? I think we should go Queen of Hearts. 
Last chance to save yourself from another trip to hell. He's been thinking about it since Monday. <laughs> he asked me about it today when he walked in. So, which one should we use? We going with spades? We all in agreement? Okay. I knew you'd pick spades. That's the one I had on my slide because I knew that's the one you'd pick. <laughs> all right. Told you. I gave you a chance to change your mind. I gave you a chance. Okay, so spades. That was, I did all that just for fun because I, I did that trick to you guys the other day on Monday, and I know some of you are still thinking of it. And uh, Jace's theory was that there was some verbal ambiguity, but there was not, and I recapped to him. How it works. Well, don't do it. Let's, let's talk about it afterwards. Okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm not, I just went, we, we got to go with the lecture, but let's, we can talk about it afterwards, and I'll let you know. Yeah. All right. What about this one? <laughs> Any thoughts on that one? All right. So exercise number two. How many cards must be selected from a standard deck of cards to guarantee that at least three hearts are chosen? Before, it was just any three. So any one box could have three in it. But now I'm saying, no, I want the heart box to have three in it. Okay? This is a pigeonhole problem again, right? Now look at our formula here. Do we know any of these variables? We know one variable. We know k. That's it. That's all we know. So the, the point is that the pigeonhole principle, the generalized pigeonhole principle, doesn't always work to solve these. So we have to kind of think through this one a little bit differently, OK? So here's a full deck of cards here. What's the worst case scenario to guarantee that at least three hearts are chosen? Right, select all the cards that are not hearts, right? So we select all of those, right? How many cards is that? 39. That's 39 cards, okay? And then I want to guarantee that three hearts were chosen, so I got to pick three more hearts. So 39 plus 3 hearts, and it said it's the answer to life, meaning, and universe, or universe, what is it? Life, universe, and everything. That's what it is. Anyway, yeah, 42. So the, to guarantee that you get at least 3 hearts. Now, again, we could have chosen 3 hearts right off the bat, randomly. I have a deck here. I should try it. It is a shuffle deck. This won't play well on the camera, but that's okay. Here we go. One, two, three. <laughs> All black cards. No, nope, not even a red one. All right, so two spades and a club. But we could have. It could have been three hearts, right? All right, so moving on here. These, again, these are review from the other day. I just want to make sure we're, we're kind of understanding this. How many people are needed to guarantee that at least two people have the exact same first and last initials? What's your last name, Jace? Hartville. Okay, JP. Um, my Um, well, I was just my last name being Stone. I was just thinking to see if we had similar initials. Actually, uh, JP over here. That's the same. No, it's not. It's Jesus Otteson. I don't know where the P comes from. Anyway, <laughs> just check. It's a middle name or something, but he goes by JP. Anyway, so I heard some numbers being thrown out. What did I hear? Same 26 squared plus 1. 26 squared plus 1. Very good. This is, uh, what kind of problem is this, though? It's part pigeonhole, part something else. Product rule, right? So how many different sets of first and last initials can exist? And that's what you guys just figured out, 26 times 26, right? And then to the code. Quickly, I'm going to show you. I just wrote this last night so we can use it today. If you ever wanted to see what a self-join looks like, here you go. So I have a table here that says, that just has, um, I don't know where I can't type, from letter, letter, 
that herbs. Just every, oh, I ran my query. So this has every letter of the alphabet in it, that's all. What I did was a self-join. I joined this table onto itself and that creates a Cartesian product and it's displaying every single possible combination of the letters, right? So if we go all the way back to the top here, way back up here, you'll see it started off with A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, A, E, and then you get down to the Bs, and it's B, A, B, 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 C, right? That's every single possible combination. That's the Cartesian product. That's the, the two together. That's 26 times 26, which that number, if we look at the bottom there, is 676, okay? So a quick little code example. Just want to show that to you just because it's fun. We're going to do another one like that in a few minutes. So we have 26 times 26 possible sets of initials, and then we just, for the pigeonhole principle, add one. And that means we need 677 people to guarantee. Any person that we add to that list, their initials were guaranteed to be one of those matching, those pairs in that list there, okay? I think we got that. We're, we're doing okay with all this? We good? Okay. Oh. What's that? Why did we add one? Because uh, if there's 676 possible initials, uh -huh. that you could have 676 people and they'd all have different initials. That's possible. Uh -huh. So if I wanted somebody that has a duplicate of somebody else's initial, I'd need one more person, oh, right? See. And that one extra person will guarantee that it's going to be somewhere in that list. So if we look at that list again, That's every single possible combination, right? And that's a total of 676 people. So name two random initials. TP. TP. It's on the list. It'll be here because it's every possible initial, right? So there's TP right there, right? So if somebody walked in the room, the 677th person, that person's guaranteed to have one of those initials that, that's, that those other seven, 676 people are in the room right now. They have every one of those possible initials. The next guy that comes in, he will have... A duplicate of somebody's, right? Does that make sense? Uh, we're going to spell and type. Okay. So, next question. How many ways can you roll a four or a five on a six-sided die? How many ways can you draw a, f a face card from a standard deck of cards? And how many ways can you do one or the other? How many ways can you roll a four or a five on a six-sided dice? No, it's even just one roll. How many ways are there that a dice can end up with a four or five on it? Yeah, I'm, I'm rolling one die. I roll it. How many different ways can it land as a four or a five? Just two times, because there's only one four and one five on the die. And if I roll it, there's only two ways I can get one of those numbers, right? Does that make sense? Where were you coming up with three? I'm curious where that was coming from. You were saying how many ways can you roll a four or a five? Uh-huh. Honestly, oh. Yeah. I was oh, you thought four, five, five or six. six. Okay, I see. Seven. Gotcha. There you go. Good. Okay. So yeah, that, that's a simple, basic, simple idea, right? Just it's just two. Uh, where's my clicker at? There we go. Um, oh, I, I got my other slide here. What kind of problems are these? What kind of problems are these? Yeah, good. The addition rule, sum rule. Okay, simple counting stuff and addition rule, right? All right. So this first one, what's the answer to that? We decided it's two. How many ways can you draw a face card from a standard deck of cards? Sounds right to me, right? Jack, queen, king of hearts, clubs, and spades, and diamonds. That's 12, right? Okay, 12. Now, here's the tricky one. How many ways are there to do one or the other? Yeah, if, I, if I, I've got, I got a deck of cards here, I don't have any dice with me, but if I were to pick one thing and either roll a four or a five or pick a card and hope that it's a face card, how many ways can I do one of the, have one of those results? And the answer is there are 14 ways to get one of those results, right? That's our addition rule. If you can do 
task one or task two, this many times, that many times, you add them together. That's how many times you could do one or the other. Okay? And if you're confused about that, go back to last uh, Monday's stuff and watch the video there. And I broke that into two 30-minute videos, so it's not too bad. And you could probably watch them on speed and a half or even double speed and get through both of them in a half an hour probably. All right, number five. How many single scoop ice cream cones can you make with, 30, with three different cones, 31 flavors, and then four toppings? And note that no toppings is also a possibility, right? Which that essentially becomes a fifth topping when you do the math. But what's the, what kind of problem is this? It's multiplication or product rule problem, right? Very good. And how do we do this? <laughs> to the code. I'm up in the middle of the night making databases for all this stuff. <laughs> All right, so I made a database called Ice Cream. Uh, well, how many with one scoop and one topping? Yeah, uh, I think I, I should have clarified that in the question, but that's a good point, though. Oh, let me get the query. I didn't want to rewrite it in class, save a little bit of time here. I just wrote it last time. This one's a little bit more involved. Okay, so let's look real quick uh, at the tables. Show the tables. There's cone table, flavor table, and topping table, right? Select star from cone. There are three cones, sugar, waffle, and chocolate. And then there are topping. There are 31, or sorry, those are four toppings. Wait for it. <laughs> and then the last one, select star from flavor. There are 31 flavors. Those are actually, you know where 31 flavors comes from, right? Baskin, Baskin Robbins. Robbins. These are their actual flavors. I looked, I Googled it, and they inserted those records into the database. These are their actual 31 flavors. You know where they get their, their have you seen their logo, what it looks like? The BR? The number 3-1 is in their logo, oh. right? The B, the outside of the B is the 3, and then the R, the left side of the R is the 1. BR, 31, mm -hmm. you know, look it up right now. <laughs> I'll pull it up on the screen. Baskin Robbins logo. There you go, see that? 31 right in the middle of the BR. Fabulous. All right, and then when you realize there's so many cool things hidden in logos, like you know Arby's, the roast beef place? R, B, roast yeah, beef. <laughs> yeah, it's Arby's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, trippy, huh? Anyway, so this query I wrote is going to combine, it's going to be a Cartesian product of all the flavors, all the cones, and all of the toppings, right? And I added some little extra wording in there. Look at my query there. If you guys don't know how to read databases, that's okay. Queries, that's all right. But what I've done is added some actual wording in there so we get this. It says a chocolate or a sugar cone or a waffle cone with one scoop of this and topped with whatever, right? And so, and I've sorted them so that you can see all the waffle cones together. This is every possible waffle cone you can get with one scoop of chocolate chip ice cream and top with sprinkles. One with French vanilla top with sprinkles. One with peppermint fudge with sprinkles. And then so on down the line with every single possible topping. Okay, the final result, there's 372 possible ice creams that can be made. Okay, if we add in nothing as a topping, which the way I could do that, I could just insert into... So that will be our fifth topping. Now if I run my query again, we'll get a different result. And you'll see when it's done running, a lot longer, 465 rows. And you'll see that every possible scenario, there will be one that's topped with nothing, right? So again, that's just, uh, this is a silly database, right? But I show you it in a database because it's useful to understand that this kind of stuff with, with permutations, combinations, the product rule, the addition rule, is very applicable in databases. Databases are built on set theory, and everything in a database is sets. And so understanding how to manipulate sets and to look at different combinations of sets and different permutations of sets is very useful. So I figured I'd throw those together so you can look at that. So the answer was uh, 3 times 31 times 4, right? Or times 5 if we're, doing no, if we're counting the no toppings. <laughs> to the whiteboards. All right, everybody did these. You got the formulas pretty quickly, so let's just walk through it very briefly. 
So the type of bread, one type of bread, one type of meat, and one type of cheese. That's pretty straightforward, right? There are three different breads I can pick, which you guys got. And then there are five different meats I can choose from, right? And then there are six different che cheeses I can choose from, right? So three times five times six. You guys all got that one. I think that's 90, if I'm not mistaken, okay? All right, so that's pretty straightforward. The next one's a little bit trickier, and but you guys all figured this out, so this is good. I'll give you the breads there, three, easy. But what about the meats? How do we calculate that? Okay, the way we do it is we have to think about the different different options here. There are three meats allowed. So for the first meat, I've got six options, five options, sorry. And then for the second meat, I have four options. And then the next meat, I have three options, right? Make sense? Okay, so let's put that, comes up to 60, let's put that back in there. And then the same thing happens with the cheeses, right? We have six cheeses. I'm going pretty quickly because you guys all figured this out already, but I want it on the recording. All right, so the six cheeses and then once I, so let's, whatever the six cheeses are, I chose Swiss for my first slice of cheese. Well, that leaves me, I don't know, American, Gouda, Havarti, Cheddar, and American. That's five more cheeses, right? I can pick from one of those five. That's what's left, okay? All right, so that comes to 30. Multiply that, that out, and you will get your answer of 5,400, okay? Last thing there. The exact same thing, but this time you're allowed to have duplicate meats. In the previous one, you couldn't have roast beef and roast beef and roast beef. You couldn't have three helpings of roast beef. You had to have roast beef, ham, and turkey or whatever. Now we're allowed to do that. So again, it's going to be three for the breads. And for every type of bread, there are how many cheese, how many meats are there? There's five meats to choose from from the first batch. Second batch, I can choose from all five again. And then the same thing for the last batch. And then for the cheeses, it's the same thing. Six times six, right? Okay, hopefully that makes some sense. We're feeling okay about that? We good? You can't go vegetarian, right? <laughs> Not at this deli. Well, you could, yeah. But that wasn't the question. The question was how many of those combinations you could make, right? You go vegan, you're just getting a slice of bread, man. I hope there's no butter on it. So there's your total in case you want to know the numbers. All right, any questions about how those work? We good? That's the review portion. Took a little bit longer than I was hoping, but that's, I think we're okay. Let's talk about permutations, all right? Here's the definition of it. We're basically just counting the number of ways a set of things can be arranged. That's it. We're just counting how many ways something can be arranged or permuted, okay? That's all that we're doing. So let's take a look at this. How many ways can we arrange the seven letters in the set A, B, C, D, E, F, I? How many ways can we arrange the seven letters? So here's how this breaks down. I need to place those seven letters in different arrangements, right? So the very first letter I pick, I've got how many choices? Seven, seven choices. This is like our meat problem a second ago, right? I have seven choices. Okay, how many for the next letter? Six. Six. The next one? Five. Everybody following along what's happening there? Every time I pick a letter, I'm, I've got less choices to go with, right? Okay. Six, five, four, three, and all the way down to that. Okay. Now, that's how many ways I can arrange those. It doesn't matter what the first block is, whether that's A or B or C or F. It doesn't matter. I've got, I can be one of any seven. I have seven choices there. The total for that is 5,040. If I rearrange that, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's still the same thing, right? I'm not, it, it doesn't change anything. Changing the order of where I did I pick the first one, let's say the very first letter I picked was in the fifth position there where that seven is. Well, it doesn't matter. I still had seven choices when I chose that first letter, right? So you add all this up and there's, or you multiply this together and you get 5,040 choices. Okay, there's another name for this. We know it. Seven factorial, right? So the number of ways to arrange n things is n factorial. Okay, that, that rule holds true for every time you're just arranging a set of things, all of them. So let's do a little brief refresher on factorial and things that we need to remember about factorial that'll help us moving forward. Number one, we understand what this is. Three factorial is three times two times one, right? 
6 factorial, 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times, obviously, right? But here's the one that's, that's it's obvious, but we don't think about it as often. 6 factorial is the same thing as 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 factorial, right? Or 6 times 5 times 4 factorial, or 6 times 5 times, 6 times 5 factorial, right? Those are all the same thing. Make sense? That will be useful in a few minutes. And the other thing we want to remember is that 0 factorial is equal to 1. If you want a proof on that, we can do it after class. I can show you. I, I don't think we'll have time to do it on the video here, but I can show you why that's true if you want. Yeah. So questions about factorial, about the basic permutation idea. We're going to look at a ton of examples, but I want to make sure, big picture, we're feeling okay. We good? Okay. So let's take a look at the next idea here. The question I want to know is how many ways can I arrange four of the letters in the set A, B, C, D, E, F, and I? Okay. Just four of them, any four. Maybe A, B, C, and E, or maybe D, F, I, and A, right? How many ways can I arrange? Just pick four of them out and rearrange them. How many ways can I do that? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to ultimately end up with a, a four-digit number for the one of a four-digit letter or whatever, four-letter word. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. So how many choices are there for the first block? There are seven options, right? How about the second block? Six options. It's the same idea, right? How many are for the next block? I've used up two choices. I've got five left. Five choices. And then the final letter? Four choices. So this is six times seven times five times four. I said that out of order. But from this idea, we're able to derive a formula about how permutations work. Because this isn't a standard permutation. I'm not permuting everything. I'm permuting some of the things, right? So do you agree with the following statements? I want to walk through them in baby steps and make sure you agree every step of the way. Step number one, that 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 is the same thing as 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 divided by 3 times 2 times 1. Do you agree with that? We all okay with that? Yep, good, okay. Would you agree that's the same thing, right? 7 factorial divided by 3 factorial. That so far... If I were to do 7 factorial divided by 3 factorial, I would get whatever 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 is, right? Agreed? Okay. Would you also agree that that's the same thing as 7 factorial divided by 7 minus 4 factorial? Yeah? Okay. So, so far, every formula I've shown you will give me whatever it is when I multiply these, three num these four numbers together. Okay. So, here's how we generalize this. Will that n be equal to this, the cardinality of the set to be permuted? So what's the cardinality of the set that we're going to permute here? Seven, Seven right? Yeah. How many distinct things there are, okay? And uh, we might want to be careful with using cardinality in this case because there are scenarios where we're going to have duplicates and we will want to count them. You know what I mean? Like, I might have A, B, B, and I want to know how many ways I can permute that, right? Um, so, yeah, be careful with the word cardinality. I probably should change that. But since it's on the recording, I'm going to leave it in there. But uh, know that really just let N be the, the number of items that we're going to permute, okay? So in this case, 7. Let K be the number of elements to be permuted, right? In this case, it's 4. We're going to permute 4 of the seven things, right? So thus, the number of ways to permute k of n items is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. You buy that? Okay. So here's how it's written and how we say it, okay? We'll say this is permutation of n elements k at a time. That's how you'll say that. It's also written like this, n, little n, big P, little k, n permute k. Or the function P with n and k as variables. All of those are valid ways to do this. <laughs> to the whiteboards. All right, how do we do? If we use our formula here, again, n factorial, divided by n minus k factorial, which we all did, and you plug in the values, this is what we get for those three equations, right? Which is equal to those answers which I think everybody got. Now, 
if you look at this, you can actually simplify this in your head somewhat, right? So let's just take the first one here. 6 times 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, divided by 3 times 2 times 1. You automatically cross off on the top and the bottom 3 on, 3, 2, 1, right? So you're just left with 6 times 5 times 4. Now, that's an easy enough calculation to do in your head there. When you get to more numbers, it's harder. But that one, you can pretty much do 6, um, six permute 3 in your head, pretty much, right? So it's pretty easy, and if we, if the way we walk through our first example with the four letters out of the seven, seeing how it's just working your way through the factorial and stopping at the fourth digit or whatever, it's pretty easy to see how to do this without having to worry about the formula. You just ignore those and then do the math with the rest of them, okay? And again, the same thing here. If you look at number two, it's just ultimately going to be 12 times 11 times 10 times 9, 8, 7, right? Make sense? Because 12 minus 6 fact is 6 factorial down below. We're just getting rid of that whole 6 factorial on the top and bottom. And then the last one, it's just 11 times 10 times 9 times 8, right? All right, let's take a look at another one. How many ways can we rearrange the letters of the word luck, right? This is a pretty simple thing, right? What's the answer? Four factorial, right? Well, whatever four factorial is. Right, but it's four factorial, which is 24, yeah. Yeah, but it's four factorial ways. Yeah, it's just permuting. Uh, this, what, is, what kind of problem is this? It's a permutation problem. It's a four permute four, or it's permuting four elements four at a time, right? A minute ago, we were looking at seven elements four at a time, or six elements three at a time, or 12 elements six at a time, or 11 elements seven at a time, or whatever, right? All right, how about this word? This is a little bit different. How many ways can we rearrange the letters of the word fool? It seems like four factorial, right? Let's think about what's happening here, okay? To rearrange the letters, there are four individual letters. And if I want to rearrange them, the answer is fa four factorial. But if I want to rearrange them and have unique results, right? If I wanted to, if my question was how many words can you make, right? And let's assume that every arrangement is a, an actual real live word. Right? Obviously, they're not, but let's just say they were. So how many words can I make? Well, then I have to, we're going to have some duplication here we've got to deal with, right? Does that make sense? So these are all the ways that I can rearrange that, or are they? I'm just saying I want to rearrange all four of those letters. In all those cases, you just the zeros. Yeah, there's that set right there. And that set right there, Right? Do you understand why? I just discovered a new trick here that I can do. If I hold the control key down, my mouse turns into a laser pointer. Pretty cool, huh? So this O right here that my mouse is on, I'm swapping it for this O. So this word fool right here, I'm taking that O and I'm moving it over to here. And I'm taking this O and moving it over to here. And now I have another arrangement, right? But it looks identical. So if I literally want to know how many ways I could rearrange them, then th this is the answer. This is four factorial. But if it's, I want to know how many words I can make, and I, we make the assumption that, that every, even like O, O, F, L is a word, which it's not, but we make that assumption that everything is a word, then it's different. We have to deal with the duplication. So how do we deal with the duplication? I mean, in this case, it's kind of obvious. Just to delete those green ones, right? Just cut it in half. But it won't always be as simple as cut it in half, okay? How do we figure this out is the question. So that right there, what we're looking at is the four vectorials I pointed out. So the question I want to know is how do we account for these duplicates in our formula? It's four factorial, but what else? What do we, what, what, forget about the formula for a minute, but what piece of this we have to look at more closely? Where does the problem lie? Yeah, yeah, how many unique elements? So we have these, the O's, right, is a problem. The O's are duplicates, and they, they end up creating this scenario where we have double everything, right? So we need to divide out all of the duplicate permutations. Well, how do we figure that out? Any thoughts on that? How do, we do, how, how do we get rid of the duplication? How do we get rid of the duplicate O's there, the duplicate O problem? 
So the idea is we need to figure out how many times can I permute two O's, right? Or if I had seven O's in there, how many ways could I permute seven O's? That many ways is all the extras. We just get rid of it. So we would divide this by two factorial. There's two factorial ways to arrange the O's because there are two O's. If we divide that out, four factorial divided by two factorial, we eliminate the duplicates. You dig it? We'll look at some more examples in a minute. Does that make sense? Okay. So we end up having 12, which you can see that is half of what's going on up there. Okay. So how can we arrange, how many ways can we rearrange the letters of the word composition? And I want to know how many unique ways. I should clarify that on my slide here. How many unique ways? Okay. Can we rearrange the letters of the word composition? So what things do we have to consider if we're going to solve this problem? We had to deal with all the duplicates. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, just looking at how many letters there are, right? Yeah. So we need to look at the duplicate O's, the duplicate I's, right? There's two I's and there's three O's, and then the number of letters in the whole word. We consider all those things and we can figure out our answer. Okay, there's three O's, there's two I's. How many letters are in the whole word? Yes. <laughs> All right, so there are 11 letters in the word, right? All right, so what's our final formula look like? 11 factorial divided by 3 factorial times 2 factorial, right? That's, that's the same problem we did a second ago. We, uh, just how many ways can I rearrange those letters, assuming they were all unique? 11 factorial, done. But the problem is, they're not all unique letters. So I want to get rid of the duplicate O's and duplicate I's. Well, there's 3 factorial ways to permute those O's, and 2 factorial ways to permute those I's, Divide that out, and we have our final answer of 3,326,400, okay? Next example. This one's a little bit trickier. It applies to permut uh, uses permutations in a different way. The question is, how many paths are there from the position 1,1 one, one to the position 5,6 on a Cartesian graph if you can only go right or up, okay? So let's look at a visualization of this. Here's our graph. Our little green dot there is starting at position 1. It wants to make its way to position 5, 6. It's roughly at 5, 6. I didn't take the time to really measure it, but roughly, okay? So let's take a look at what can happen here. Let's move him back, and we're going to leave a little purple dot to remind us where we're headed, okay? I could go over 1, so there's a, an R down below for I move right. Then I could go, man, it would be awesome if I predicted which way you guys would go here. That'd be crazy, right? But no. I did predict your suit, though. And then I went up one, see that? And then I went up another one. And I went up a third time. And now I'm gonna go to the right. And I'm gonna go up again. And then I'm gonna go right. And then I'm gonna go right. And then I went up. So that's the path I took, right? My question is, how many different versions of that exist? That's one way that I went. I could have gone all up first and all right, or I could have gone right, right, up, up, right, right, up, or whatever. I don't know if I said the right number of letters there, but I could have done anything, assuming there's no backtracking. So how do we calculate this? What exactly is going on here? I just want to know how many ways I can do that. Look at the letters I have below. That's kind of a clue. Yeah, exactly right. So look, I just rearranged them to a different way, right? That's another way I could have gone, right? I went from, that's one way I went. That's another way I went. That's another way I could have gone. That's another way I could have gone. Well, if we look at it like this, how many ways could I rearrange those letters? Well, it's nine factorial, right? But we have duplicates, right? If I go write one and then write two, then write three, then write four, well, it's the same thing as what does even write four mean, right? It's just I went right. So doing this permutation and rearranging the first and the second R is the same thing. Still went right twice in a row, okay? So it's nine factorial, dividing out the duplicate R's, permutations of the duplicate R's, and the permutations of the duplicate U's. And whatever that calculates to gives us 126, okay? So there's 126 ways to go from a very small place, one, one to five, six. It's a pretty small distance to travel, 126 ways. Permutation example number eight. I told you, lots of examples today. The best way to understand this is just walk through these things instead of me giving you theoretical formulas and stuff. Let's just look at examples, right? How many ways can I line up six people in a row? This one you guys should know. It should be easy. What is it? 
It's next factorial, right? Easy. Okay. Here's where it gets tricky. How many ways can I sit six people around a circular table? So something like this, okay? This is one scenario. So is the answer six factorial? So if I rotate this exact permutation here, that's still the same thing. There's no difference. So I can't count that as a new one, right? Yeah, there's still the same order, right? It's still, I'm asking how many ways can I arrange them, right? So it's still the exact same order. If I rotate it again, that's still the same order, right? Now, if I were asking how many different ways can I do it, and, and there's like a, each seat had a meaning, each spot at the round table was a specific kind of place, but it's a round table. So when, I'm, when it's in a circle like this, it changes things a little bit. So how many different ways can I do it? It does start out with six factorial. But for every single one of those six factorials, there's six versions of it that are identical. Just follow that? Six factorial minus divided by six. Divided by six, yeah. Yeah. So, and we'll see a couple formulas that represent it, yeah. So, but the idea though, because there are six items, you can line them up six factorial ways. But when you put them in a circle, and you're wanting just to see wh what the circle looks like, the circle looks the same for every one of those six factorial ways. There are six versions of that circle that are identical to each other, right? So let's move this guy out of the way here and look at what's happening here. We have, there. how many ways are there to, how many ways are there to position each permutation? Yes, that was six, that's what you said, right? I should rely on my slides a little more because I just end up talking and then I find that the next slide was what I was going to say. Here. So this is the idea here. It's six factorial divided by six, right? Or n factorial divided by n, or as you pointed out, it's n one factorial, n minus one factorial, okay? All those, the same idea. So when you're dealing with something that's circular like this, this is how you deal with it, okay? Page 394, which is in chapter 6.1, the, the basics of counting, it talks about this, the division rule, okay? Remember, we had the addition rule, the product rule, the subtraction rule, which we covered on Monday. And then I told you there was a division rule. Check it on page 394. There's like two paragraphs about it. It's very short, but it's very written it like some guy that's got like nine PhDs in rocket science or something, man. It's really hard to read. So read it, but study it, okay? Any questions about that idea?